comes up and then we'll start. All right. Welcome, everyone. I am Walter Mead, a, uh, the Ravenel Curry uh, Fellow here at Hudson Institute. And today I'm really very fortunate, very happy to welcome Dr. Kurt Campbell to join us. Dr. Campbell is the coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs on the National Security Council, which means he holds one of the most important posts in the U.S. government at a critical time. He was co-founder of the Center for a New American Security and CEO of the Asia Group, served as Assistant Secretary of State for, for East Asian and Pacific Affairs from 2009 through 2013. <clears throat> Uh, for the past 20 years or more, Dr. Campbell has been one of the people most closely engaged with the development of American foreign policy for the Indo-Pacific region, now widely recognized as the most important strategic and economic theater for the 21st century. Long before many others understood fully the importance of the region in American foreign policy, Dr. Campbell worked to build a consensus inside and outside government to recognize and respond to emerging challenges. His contributions to American policy and strategy in the region are widely recognized around the world. Uh, here at Hudson, we're honored to have you. We thank you for coming. We appreciate what you're doing. And I guess to begin with, um, I'd like to ask you maybe what some would say is the, is the biggest question in American foreign policy um, today, which is, how do we think about what's happening with you with us china relation china in the world what's what's the smart way to try to wrap our heads around this development yeah well first of all uh walter respect to you um you've been a terrific commentator and uh thought leader on uh, american history american foreign policy and i'm always appreciative when you reach out and it's great to be at hudson and i look forward to this conversation today um, we've asked the hardest and most important question in American foreign policy without, without doubt. And I, I would simply say that at the outset when the Biden administration came into office, I think it was clear when there was a sort of a deep review of the information available that there was a sense in some uh, capitals that the United States was in a process of decline. Um, was being challenged domestically and internationally, that our industrial base was in disarray, that some of our allies were questioning our position. I think there was a general acknowledgement that the Trump administration had correctly identified some of the challenges uh, that uh, the United States were facing with respect to China's rise, China's uh, increasingly provocative activities on the global stage. But I think the idea was to put in place what uh, the president and his team hoped would be a consequential strategy that would have many elements. And I think probably the most important element was to try to erect a bipartisan consensus on the major uh, elements of a strategy in the Indo-Pacific. And I think, Walter, you are correct that there's always been a struggle about what is the dominant theater or whether it's even appropriate to think of foreign policy in these regional terms. But if you do believe, as I do, that the lion's share of the history in the 21st century is going to be written in the Indo-Pacific, the idea is to uh, undertake that challenge in a way that is bipartisan, that uh, is subjected to serious internal discussion and debate and then applied coherently on the global stage. So I think you know the, the president's general instincts are to try to work even when it's difficult in a bipartisan way. We saw that exhibited last week with respect to the budget deal. But I think beginning first with a series of discussions with partners and friends on in the think tanks on Capitol Hill, I think the element uh, the elements of our strategy are these. First, uh, to invest domestically uh, with respect to technology and capabilities. And I recognize there's lots of contention about that, questions about is there a better way to seed technology to bring manufacturing home. I, I'm happy to have that debate, but I think without question, the CHIPS Act and IRA, other provisions are some of the most consequential um, powerful examples of the United States determining they will not, that we will not cede the high ground on technology. And technology will be the cutting edge arena of global competition in the way, 
in the period ahead in the way nuclear missiles were the sort of the defining feature of uh, the Cold War. And so I think that effort took place over the last year and a half. Simultaneously, I think what we have sought to do is to build and sustain a uh, innovative and complex set of engagements with allies and partners. And we can talk about that in our discussion today. And that means doubling down on our bilateral relationships with Japan and South Korea and Australia, our key partners uh, in the Indo-Pacific, linking the Indo-Pacific more with Europe. I think one of the appropriate criticisms, Walter, of the pivot um, that preceded this and the past was that somehow we gave the impression that we were turning away from Europe um, and that we were focusing exclusively on the Indo-Pacific. And I think anyone who has ever followed anything about American foreign policy understands that everything that we have done of consequence in our history, we have done largely with Europe. And I think what we've sought to do this time is to work more effectively with Europe in the Indo-Pacific. And frankly, the reverse is also true, working with Indo-Pacific partners in Europe, like on extraordinary challenges like Ukraine. This was highlighted uh, at the Hiroshima summit in which some of the strongest statements of support for Ukraine were found in the Indo-Pacific region as a general proposition. Innovative partnerships like AUKUS, like the Quad, um, trilateral engagements that bring in new partners like the Philippines, working constructively, deeply committed to the partnership with India, recognizing that this will be, in my view, the most important bilateral relationship for the United States in the 21st century. But basically trying to weave all these together in a way that sends a comprehensive message of American engagement in the region and really weaving together a group of countries who believe in the operating system that we and other countries uh, have helped create over 40 years in the Indo-Pacific that has provided the greatest period of prosperity in our history. And then lastly, to undertake a careful, responsible, pragmatic diplomacy with China, recognizing that China is going nowhere, that, that it is important to ensure that there is appropriate diplomacy on the critical uh, issues of our times, whether it's climate change or fentanyl or uh, Iran, North Korea, Ukraine. Those are all topics in which it's important to compare notes, to see if we can avoid challenges, and to see in certain circumstances whether there are alignments. And would you say at this point you, you feel that we're making progress with China on finding some areas of, of mutual cooperation? We're reading a lot of press accounts now that it's not, very, it's not going particularly well. I, I think that's an enormous challenge. I, I think that would be going too far. I think the more important thing to underscore at this stage, Walter, is that uh, the lines of communications are opening up and we are able to lay out more constructively our areas of interest and concern. And I would highlight that one of the things that you heard from General Austin, Secretary Austin in uh, Shangri-La, was the importance of the United States and China establishing mechanisms of communication, procedures for crisis management. China is increasingly a great power. Her forces rub up against ours much more uh, than they did in the past. The potential for miscalculation, uh, inadvertence, is uh, real and growing. Uh, during the Cold War, we managed to effectively create mechanisms that would allow for crisis communication in moments of unintended uh, uh, conflict or tension. Um, I, don't, I think it'd be fair to say we've been unable to do that yet with China. China has been reluctant to uh, embrace and engage in some of these uh, mechanisms. Um, I think we and other countries, other like-minded countries, have been making the case consistently publicly uh, and in private uh, behind closed doors why these mechanisms are essential. And frankly, the juxtaposition of Secretary Austin making this case at the very time mm. that a 
Chinese destroyer was practicing dangerous navigational uh, tactics um, against a freedom of navigation uh, mission in the Taiwan Straits, I think was absolutely clear about why this is so important. Yep. Um, we will definitely be talking about the regional context more because I, I, one of the things I, I really do appreciate about your approach is, the, is, is understanding that, that one doesn't talk about China in separation from the rest of the region. It, it doesn't make sense. But just in terms of, of U.S.-China relations and the potential for some kind of really dramatic crisis that would or reorient everything, we hear, we've heard a lot of statements from people in the U.S. military and from others in the administration about the, pos the, the danger that even in the rather short term, China might take uh, action in the, in the, across the Taiwan Straits or otherwise trying to compel Taiwan to accept sort of uh, a mainland diktat over the, the future. Uh, how worried are you that something might happen quickly, relatively quickly? Well, look, we, Walter, you, you put your finger on it. We have to remain vigilant. And I think as you've seen in almost every one of our engagements, we are uh, enlisting uh, other countries and institutions to make the case publicly that we all have an interest in the maintenance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. So I do believe that vigilance, important signaling, preparation, these are all essential features of the mission that the United States has been engaged in for decades, which is indeed this maintenance of peace and stability across, across the Taiwan Straits. We recognize the remarkable achievements of Taiwan, both in terms of its democracy and its technology. We herald that, we support it, uh, we want to sustain it. At the same time, I, I think we also have to be attentive, not just f about the bolt from the blue, Walter, but the challenge of the inadvertence, the miscalculation, the, the bumping into fighter planes and things mm. like that that can have unintended consequences. And so I think our objective at this time is to take the necessary steps to ensure that our deterrent uh, message and actions, which are not simply military, they are across the board, are strong, are, and are durable, are well understood, publicly communicated, and at the same time also take the necessary steps to try to prevent uh, circumstances where uh, unintended consequences can have terrible consequences. You've spoken of technology as, as a key element in um, U.S. policy and certainly and it's, it, it becomes clearer every day that, that the information revolution, uh, inf information tech is becoming critical to international power, to um, economic, the economic future. And there's been a, a lot of talk over the years about intellectual property and espionage, um, subsidies from China. We, how do you see, how is the administration working to preserve what I think some have called the commanding heights yeah. of, of information technology? Well, first of all, Walter, let me just say that one of the great challenges is that, that if you believe that the dominant uh, issues that will uh, translate into national power, the effectiveness in our ability to um, maintain uh, global leadership with respect to semiconductors or AI or um, uh, biology, synthetic biology, robotics, you can go down the list. There are a number of key technologies that are absolutely essential. This requires a very uh, complex set of activities. It means protecting certain areas that you believe are essential in terms of your own um, domestic innovation, seeding some of those where necessary, working uh, collectively with allies and partners, and then also making sure that you're taking not just bilateral but collective steps to prevent the seepage or the um, uh, stealing of uh, critical high-end capabilities uh, to other countries. I, that is an incredibly difficult challenge in the best of times. But I will also say one of the hardest things is, um, is 
ensuring that there is a group of people in our government that are literate about technology. And that is challenging. There aren't, you know, there aren't an enormous number of people that can help design what are the capabilities of the semiconductor that are absolutely essential to maintain mm -hmm. what you described, the sort of the, the leading edge. And so the, the effort that we are seeing that is underway now, which is a shift in focus more towards the Indo-Pacific, also involves a capacity creation inside the US government, both people who know more about the Indo-Pacific, but also people who are more literate with respect to technology and can inform decision making about things that will be critical for national power going forward. Are you finding that the corporate sector, finance and universities are, are seeing these dangers and, and working cooperatively with the, U, with the government to address these, or is there still some pushback? So I, I think it depends on the sector, Walter, to be uh, clear. And I have found, generally speaking, we, you know, one of my jobs is to do a lot of outreach with the finance community, with universities and the like. I find sometimes after an initial you know, session that can be somewhat heated, mm -hmm. once we're able to listen, go through various activities that we are contemplating, things that we think are important, you know, most of these people are patriots and they're reasonable. They hopefully see that they're sitting across the table with people that have what they believe to be the best interest of the United States also at the uh, top of mind. Um, I, I have found, generally speaking, that um, while not, you know, uniformly accepted, the, the, the dialogues with the academic finance and business community have become probably more robust over time. And I think there are elements of, of what is taking place in China that affect uh, universities, businesses. And so I, I, I think um, we're in the past, perhaps some elements of policy in the Trump administration and now in the Biden administration were questioned, I think probably less so. I think there is a recognition that there are challenges uh, to our institutions uh, by certain activities in China and that there needs to be um, appropriate steps as a consequence. Great. Well, let's, uh, let's go to kind of maybe a tour d'horizon of the sure. regions. And I, you know, we, we see in East Asia maybe, uh, and it, always it's difficult to define, the Philippines sort of yeah. floats, but I've seen a lot of activity from the administration in all of these regions, but in, in the East Asia with the Philippines, pr with the greater cooperation between Japan and South Korea, yeah. yet at the same time we're seeing the Chinese being more active around Taiwan and in the Straits, and we're certainly seeing North Korea um, continuing to raise issues of concern. How does the administration look at East Asia and where, where are you confident that you're succeeding and, and what worries you? Yeah. So look, there are a lot of issues that I think one has to be concerned by, Walter. Um, but also there are some areas of reassurance as well. I would say that Prime Minister Kishida in Japan's hosting of the G7, probably one of the most consequential mm -hmm gatherings probably didn't get the attention it deserved. But if you looked at the areas of solidarity between the United States and Europe on collective efforts on technology, on, on, on debt, on economic coercion, it's quite remarkable. And it does suggest a degree of common purpose that is, um, I think, important. And uh, we intend to try to nurture that going forward. Um, uh, I think it is also the case that at the G7, you saw a number of groupings, both the trilateral grouping between the United States, Japan, and South Korea, the Quad, uh, other uh, uh, unofficial gatherings that we think are important with respect to the fabric of strengthening the region as a whole. If you ask me what I thought the critical challenges uh, were, though, I think the question of the uh, uh, American extended deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. We tend not to appreciate how important this has been to um, uh, Asia's peace, uh, Walter, for decades. There are probably 
10 countries in Asia that have um, the capacity to build nuclear weapons that have chosen not to. And one of the key reasons that that has been the case is the sense of the durable, predictable American forward deployments of our forces, but also of our extended deterrence. When President Yoon was here just a month and a half ago, um, President Biden, President Yoon issued the Washington Declaration, which was designed to try to buttress through a number of steps, new mechanisms, new deployments, that America's um, commitment to forward extended deterrence uh, remained rock solid. But I think we have to recognize that there are challenges um, to what we think has been a very favorable set of considerations when it comes to extended deterrence. One is increasing North Korean provocations. And in our diplomacy, this harkens back to an earlier question that you asked, Walter, we've made clear to China that these actions on the part of North Korea are destabilizing and they're leading countries to reconsider their options. It's one of the factors that went into Japan's decision to up its uh, military commitments to basically move beyond some of the previous self-imposed constraints that they had on uh, military capabilities. And it has also caused South Korea to rethink a number of its long-held provisions. Uh, Russia's saber rattling on the nuclear realm has also been felt across uh, the Indo-Pacific. And it is also the case that although it has received less attention, the fact that China is in the midst of what can only be described as a massive nuclear buildup has consequences in the region as a whole. So I think going forward, Walter, it will be incum incumbent on this administration and future administrations to take every possible step to make clear that the United States is serious about sustaining our extended uh, deterrent guarantees uh, to the Indo-Pacific and to other countries. I think, secondly, um, uh, I do worry uh, vulnerable regions uh, are under pressure. Um, uh, I've worked a lot in the Pacific. Uh, the Pacific are proud nations, many of which have supported us for decades. And we have a moral, historic, and strategic commitment to them. Uh, I think it would be fair to say that, that a succession of administrations have let the Pacific down. This is a bipartisan neglect, mm. and it is critical for us to step up our game. This is not just voting in the UN. This is climate change as an existential issue. It is dealing with these countries as important players uh, strategically. Um, we need to meet them where they live with respect to the challenges that they face with, with respect to training and climate change and illegal fishing. And we're trying to do that. Uh, and again, this is another area where we've received a lot of encouragement from Republican friends more generally. There are a number of states in Asia that are problematic. Um, North Korea, uh, first and foremost. Every effort, I see my friend Jen Pristip here who's who's worked on this for many years in the past, every effort at diplomacy that we've done to reach out to North Korea in recent period has failed. Everything has failed since basically the uh, high level uh, diplomacy between President Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un that ended abruptly in Vietnam. Um, but what receives less attention is the tragedy of Burma, of Myanmar. Mm. Um, uh, we're deeply concerned by the humanitarian plight, the brutality of the military junta, um, and those uh, issues tend to make diplomacy in ASEAN, which is the key organizing institution of Asia, uh, much more complicated. So look, there are going to be lots of challenges here. Um, all of these countries are stepping up their defense spending. Uh, much of this is uh, uh, devoted to capabilities that are involving power projection to try to secure uh, maritime domains, domains that are increasingly under challenge. Um, I, I think the, what we have generally found, Walter, is that the demand signal for American leadership in, in uh, uh, active participation is undimmed. 
and and the hope will be whoever you know follows will continue to understand that the essential feature in the maintenance of peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific, the essential feature of basically helping to orchestrate some of these um, nuanced and uh, diverse venues is in fact the United States. Do you find in Asia that there's concern that the U.S. will be distracted by Ukraine and the crisis with Russia from from a focus on the Indo-Pacific? I, I, I would be, um, at, at the outset, I would be lying if I didn't acknowledge that I, I probably had some concerns for that. I don't think that should dim in any way our commitment um, to what's going on in Ukraine. But what we have found has been actually completely the reverse. Our diplomacy with the Indo-Pacific, if anything, has stepped up. Our diplomacy with Europe has stepped up. The connections that have formed for a variety of reasons, there is an undeniable connection to what happens in Ukraine has implications for peace and stability in Asia, and that is not lost on any country in the region as a whole. So if anything, um, it has led to a deeper, more fundamental commitment um, to the Indo-Pacific. I think largely because there is probably a greater recognition for what the stakes are uh, involved. Let's, uh, let's turn to India, because yeah. uh, Prime Minister Modi is coming to Washington very soon for what looks to be one of the highest profile visits by a foreign leader, um, state dinner, um, uh, joint address to Congress. Um, yeah. it's, uh, a lot of deliverables seem to be falling into place. What's your hopes for what will happen with this visit? My, my hope is that this visit basically consecrates uh, the U.S.-India relationship as the most important bilateral relationship for the United States on the global stage, and that we effectively make it into sort of escape velocity. And what, what I have seen um, in my own uh, period of engaging with India, one of the most important things that has been developed in this process, yes, there will be deliverables, yes, there will be discussion about areas where we are united, areas where we still continue to have uh, concerns. Um, you know, both, of, both the United States and India are imperfect democracies. We both have challenges. I think we will be discussing it in that context. But I think what has also developed more and more between the United States and India is a degree of trust and confidence that, frankly, was not present um, a, a decade ago. And I think our goal will, will be to seek to build on that. Mm -hmm. And that certainly seems to be a bipartisan consensus as far I, as I I believe it is. I believe it is. And I think everyone understands the critical role that India is playing on the global stage. That, that role is not, Walter, simply strategic. Many uh, uh, business groups, investment groups, are looking at India as part of a strategy to diversify globally, new supply chains, new investment opportunities. I, the most impressive diaspora I've engaged with, Indian Americans in the United States who are proud and pleased with what they see generally in terms of the embrace going forward, I think the hope will be to open up venues and activities for more investment, for more people to people. We need, our universities need to train many more engineers and high tech people. And I think the general attitude of India is send me, give me this opportunity. And so we want to open those opportunities up for greater people to people across the board. So yeah, I, I, I'm grateful for the way you pr presented this, Walter, because I actually think that's what the stakes are involved. I think this potentially could be one of the most important sort of, you know, uh, uh, juncture points with the potential for the United States and India to assume its place, this relationship as um, really the critical um, dynamic uh, relationship that I think uh, we aspire to. Um, to turn to Southeast Asia more, I, we've spoken a little bit about Myanmar, but that strikes me as if we think of, you know, East Asia, um, things seem to be going fairly well in terms of relationships and, and developments. South Asia, as you say, we're, we're reaching a lift, an escape velocity maybe with India. 
with uh, Australia, the, the Pacific Islands, a lot of really good things are happening. AUKUS. AUKUS, of course, um, building new embassies in on some of these Pacific Island nations yeah. and, and reaching out, I think, in a very important way. Southeast Asia is a, is a little bit more complex, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the things, and I have to admit, this is something I really don't understand, which is a newspaper commentator, I hate to admit, but what's happening in Thailand and how the elections in Thailand and some of the internal difficulties yeah. there play into the larger regional questions, play into Myanmar. Where yeah. are we with Thailand and how do you see it? Let, let me give you a larger picture if I can. Obviously, we engage ASEAN as an institution and they convene the dominant diplomacy of the Indo-Pacific, and we think that's important, and the President has paid heed to that, hosted all the ASEAN leaders here uh, last year, intends to engage actively with the ASEAN leaders. But it is also important, Walter, to recognize that ASEAN is made up of key countries, and we have to basically engage intensively with a couple of those countries, which we think will play a key role going forward. For me, the countries that I think you're beginning to see will play a central role in American strategy. Uh, obviously, Singapore, um, we have a forward deployed engagement there, very close strategic dialogue. They are more an enduring, although they will face leadership changes, but an enduring feature in American strategy. But I would say Vietnam and uh, the Philippines with you, the recent visit of President Marcos, which really has uh, uh, ushered in a new period of closer partnership between Washington and Manila, reminiscent, but frankly different and deeper than the kind of partnership that we had during much of the Vietnam War. And we're looking forward to consequential diplomacy with Vietnam, and we recognize Vietnam's key role as a destination for more investment in technology. They have a keen strategic interest. They have, um, uh, they've played a decisive role in insisting on, um, uh, on uh, how to interpret issues with respect to the South China Sea. So I think those areas, I think, are of critical importance. Thailand, um, we've watched carefully uh, the election. Um, th this is a delicate phase in terms of the formation of a government. Uh, I think our goal is to sustain a strong bilateral relationship. They're our oldest treaty ally mm -hmm. in the Indo-Pacific. Um, we have uh, maintained a strong relationship with them. Many companies uh, uh, are invested there. We have strong uh, military uh, 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 programs and engagements uh, uh, with uh, the Thai Armed Forces. Um, I think it is uh, undeniable that the politics of Thailand have been um, unstable and complicated. I think our goal would be to support an effective, um, stable, uh, democratic government in Thailand and then work consequentially with it. But this is, a, this is an undeniably delicate time. Mm -hmm. um. This maybe brings us to this question some people have asked and I have asked. Uh, how does one relate the two objectives, American objectives, uh, democracy and human rights kind of uh, diplomacy, which is clearly important to the president and to this administration, mm -hmm. and then the, the realities of a strategic competition, which have their own logic, so that a, a country like, for example, Vietnam might be a a problematic issue for a place from a human rights or democracy point of view, but is critical from a strategic point of view. How do we, how does the administration manage that? Look, I, I, you know, having spent a little bit of time with the President Walter, I think it would be fair to say that I think the President is less about uh, outward and ostentatious proselytizing about mm -hmm. democracy and human rights and more about trying to let our model and our attempt to deal with our own challenges be um, a kind of model for how other countries might want to deal with their own um, challenges. There, look, there is always 
tension in the formulation and execution of American statecraft. There is that tension between domestic uh, economic engagement and international economic strategy, I'm sure a point you'll get to. There are questions about like the preferencing of regions one over the other, how to think about assistance versus uh, investment, um, and the question about um, it is undeniable that some of the most effective countries in East Asia are not democracies. And how do you recognize then that in your strategy going forward? I think the president understands and the administration that, that, that we can be for something but still engage on other terms. And I think that's what we've sought to do. And we are seeking broad and sustained partnerships with a variety of countries in the Indo-Pacific. And I think that is both smart and sustainable. Okay. Um, in economics, it seems to me, we've got sort of two big sets of issues. Um, one would be that for many in, in the region, at least when I, when I talk to people, what I constantly hear is trade. And, and by trade, they generally mean access to the US market as yeah. an engine for development is probably important for folks watching this to, to understand that we're talking about many countries where there's deep poverty and uh, a, a tremendous social pressure to increase living standards, yes. especially now that with cell phones and the internet, people are much more aware of the gap between their living standards and other parts of the world, and this becomes a real source of worry and political instability. The free U.S. leadership on free trade is, is widely seen there as a great engine for growth. Here, it's a much more controversial topic now, both on the left and in parts of the right these days. So how does the Biden administration plan to navigate this particular shoal? Well, look, first of all, Walter, I think you, I, I like the way you began this, put this in the larger context, what some of the challenges are. Trade is contested politically inside the United States, but there are some facts that are just undeniable. First of all, the U.S. market is one of the most open markets of any country in the world. Trade with Asia last year was at an all-time high. It is also the case that American investment, we are by and large the largest investor uh, in the Indo-Pacific in many different countries. And so we are deeply intertwined and our commercial and investment sector view the Indo-Pacific as the dominant theater for the 21st century. So that is all undeniable. I think it is, it is the case that there is a belief that some of the previous trade negotiations tended to focus on areas that were um, perhaps more controversial now. Corporatist interests that were perhaps not as transferable to the lives of, you, you talked about the lives of people outside of the United States looking in. I think we also have to be attentive mm -hmm. to those people who are affected by um, a global trade, particularly what might be described as unfair global trade, mm -hmm. some of the things that we've seen, particularly with respect um, to the practices of China. So I think it would be fair to say that, that there has been an effort to reconceptualize certain areas that we think are going to be central going forward, supply chains, issues associated with um, uh, climate, uh, uh, labor, a variety of provisions, uh, taxation that we think are crucial elements of economic uh, uh, engagement. And so what the Biden administration has sought to do with IPEF is to create a, um, a, a really new kind of venue in which many of these issues would be hammered out in ways that would level the playing field, create more predictability with respect to critical minerals and vulnerable supply chains, and essentially feature um, a uh, enhanced ability to do business, not just with the dominant um, uh, economies of Northeast Asia, but 
dyna dynamic, important economies of Southeast Asia. So for the first time, India is involved in a trade negotiation like this with the United States. So as Fiji, a Pacific Island nation. So these, you know, I, obviously there are questions about how significant this will be. I think our view uh, is that this will, uh, and, and we'll have more to say about this when the United States hosts APEC uh, later this year, that mm. this will turn out to be much more consequential than some of the critics have suggested. And I would just remind folks that when we started diplomacy uh, around TPP, which is now hailed by some, it was criticized as mm -hmm. being lacking in ambition, not significant, not the right partners. So I, I, I do want to underscore that we understand, like anyone who focuses on the Indo-Pacific, that the ticket to the big game in Asia is that you've got to engage on trade and economics and commerce. It is not sufficient to be a security player. Mm. You've got to be a full purpose, full spectrum um, uh, player in the Indo-Pacific, and that's exactly what I think this administration backed up by strong support in Congress believes what's essential. Yep. So would it be fair to say that, that IPEF is seen in some ways as a negotiating forum where, where we can deal with some of the questions that have made trade unpopular in the United States, whether it's labor standards, environmental, intellectual property, and some of these other things, with the idea that then one comes back as as IPEF matures, the, a basis for deeper trade engagement, is that the strategy? Look, um, I think that's part of what um, uh, we're getting at. The, the, the honest truth, though, is, Walter, we're actually looking for more immediate mm -hmm. deliverables. One of the things that was clear over the course of the last couple of years during COVID and other challenges is that supply chains are yep. challenged and they need to be diversified. These countries all have said, we want to play a larger role in your supply chains. And these mechanisms will make that uh, more effective and more predictable. So I don't, I don't think this is ethereal mm -hmm. or, or um, somehow theoretical. This is deeply practical. It's meant to tackle the specific issues that we're confronting today. Yep. And definitely, as you say, supply chains where we're looking to diversify from yeah. China for some of these things. It's a potential opportunity for others to replace China in that supply chain. Yeah. Yep. Um, one question I find I, I hear not only from people in the region, but from sort of young people and students and others in the U.S. is, What's the goal in Asia? You know, what is, we, we, we're, we're having all, we're concerned about the rise yeah. of China, the international system. What is it that America, what would be the point, the goal? How do we know whether we're making progress? How would you describe that? So, look, it, 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 you know, I, I remember uh, talking to a guy that I was in the Navy with, and we were out, you know, on patrol, and he said to me, you know, uh, I deploy, I deploy, therefore I am. And, and uh, uh, that, that's not how we see strategy. And so, I, look, I, I would say the way to think about this, Walter, is, you know, sometimes you hear from Chinese interlocutors that the United States is set at containment or mm -hmm. keeping uh, China down. I, I, would, I would just, you know, uh, uh, take a very different tact. I, I believe that the last 40 to 50 years have been the very best years in Asia's history. Uh, and we've led billions of people out of poverty, increased livelihoods. And including in China, of fantastic course. Fantastic innovation. And, and a number of countries have benefited from that, including China, as Walter just said. And the reason for this is not just the hard work and ingenuity of the people involved, although that is an undeniable feature of it. It is that this happened within a larger context in which this, what we might describe as an operating system to stay with technology, 
this operating system that the United States help create and sustain with the support of others, which has many factors with it, the for deployment of American uh, forces, the peaceful, the commitment to peaceful resolution of, of disputes, the ideas of, of uh, uh, legal uh, 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 abilities to solve problems, um, uh, freedom of navigation. There, there are a whole um, uh, collection, Walter, of features to that system. Imperfect, but undeniable, that woven together created the fabric for remarkable peace and prosperity. Mm. It is not a surprise that China, as a rising state, like any countless times in history, seeks to amend or adjust elements of this dominant existing system. But I think the concern that we and other countries in the Indo-Pacific has is that many of these changes, if implemented, like economic coercion or um, you know, uh, arbitrary territorial features, you can go down the list, mm. um, if implemented, would have very negative consequences for the livelihoods of uh, countries uh, and people in the Indo-Pacific, and I would argue maybe even for China. And so I, I see much of what the United States is seeking to do is to preserve, sustain, and update uh, an operating system that has worked remarkably well for us. And, and so, I, and, and, and frankly, we've found that many other countries uh, in the Indo-Pacific and in, 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 indeed in Europe recognize the salience of that argument and want very much to be part of the effort to sustain a series of, um, of, of, of mechanisms and institutions that have been stabilizing. We all recognize that they have to, they have to evolve, they have to, they have to, um, increasingly deal with the challenges of, of the global south, poor uh, uh, peoples, but at the same time recognizing some of the key features of the global system and how it's been very good to us. And so I, I sense that um, I, I think we can do a better job, Walter, in, in explaining this. Sometimes these, uh, you know, what look like, you know, why, why are we prosecuting freedom of navigation? Why do we insist on statements in the G7 that talk about uh, lending practices that, that create more poverty? Why are we focused on economic coercion? It is because if these practices become dominant, we believe that it will have a deeply antithetical set of interests mm -hmm. or uh, uh, consequences for the region that we so care so very much about. I, that's, that's probably an inadequate answer, but I do not believe this is about sustaining American dominance or um, somehow uh, seeking to keep any country down. This is simply about a set of steps that we believe that are in the best interests of um, the lion's share of the countries in the Indo-Pacific and Europe. Let me just take the liberty of throwing out some thoughts I've had about try to, trying to frame this, this problem, because I do, I do basically agree with, with everything you just said. Um, but when I look at the history of, of Asia and of the American engagement in the Indo-Pacific, it looks to me like we've had a series of crises essentially driven by uneven development, so that the British and the Europeans established colonial empires because they achieve kind of industrial development earlier than Asian societies. Then in Asia itself, Japan develops uh, earlier than others, which creates a kind of an unhealthy sense in Japan of its regional role and led to untold tragedies. Today, something similar with China as the Indian economy was 65% of China's in 1980 and is about 17% today. Um, and that imbalance, in a sense, sort of can create unreasonable expectations in China about its, 
its role, but also creates real imbalances that, that an external power like the U.S. takes an interest in. And possibly if we were to think that, that, if, that if Asia were to all be developing, that the, you know, we, we reach the point of, of full development of Asian societies, there's a kind of a natural balance of power, natural order in the region that no one country, even, certainly not us, but even India and China couldn't think about a, a hegemony. In a, in, a, in a place that's so rich and so large. And maybe part of our role is to allow that natural development of Asia towards some kind of peaceful state. Is that, is that a way, a useful way to think about things? I, I'd, I'd want to think about it a little bit more, Walter. It's interesting. I, I, I would say that, look, the, taking uh, the longer view, like let's say the last 40 or 50 years, not the... the but, but I would say that we tend to get in trouble during periods in which American power is questioned. Mm. Um, and we've seen that on a number of occasions. We saw it during the Korean War when our forces were overrun at the beginning. A lot of questions about whether the fighting spirit was lost after the victories of the Second World War. Um, many of our closest allies were concerned by the route in Vietnam, subsequently thinking about their own nuclear developments going their own way. Uh, it took real courage of uh, people in the Reagan administration to reassert American power uh, in uh, East Asia. At the end of the Cold War, there was a sense that you know the United States and Russia, the Soviet Union, had exhausted one another and Japan had prevailed. And then during the economic crisis the, in 2007, mm, 2008, mm. a sense that for all of our lecturing that American financial institutions had been shown to be, to be imperfect. During much of that, questions about American staying power and American commitment, and that, that is seeded and furthered by questions about either um, domestic disarray or preoccupation, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I, I think my, my biggest takeaway, Walter, during this period is that if we can send a signal of American constancy and engagement that's bipartisan, that is, that is resourced, that is not just military, and that we are seen as a steady uh, and um, a uh, deeply engaging presence across all political uh, players along the lines that your previous question. Uh, and frankly, uh, most of these countries want to see a careful, purposeful diplomacy between the United States and China. If we can do that, I think um, it is easier to sustain the kind of peace and stability that you describe. I think what concerns me, even in that framework, is that it is undeniable beginning, you know, in the late 1990s, what we've seen is a massive military investment on the part of China. Um, and, and that's not something that's noted just by the United States, but by every country in the region. And I've had um, many uh, diplomatic interlocutors in Southeast Asia and, and elsewhere say, why do they need this kind of investment? Shouldn't they be investing more in the healthcare system or in retirement and the like. And so those questions remain, and I, I, I think the imbalances are clear, but it's not just the imbalances, it's what you spend your public financing on. And some of those military um, investments are, uh, are, are creating anxieties. And it, people don't always talk about it, but they are creating anxieties across the region as a whole. So my, my general answer to you, Walter, is that if you ask me again what's necessary, I think institution building, true norm building in which, you know, we learn some of the lessons of the, you know, the, uh, the WTO and like how cert, uh, allowing certain uh, state activities to undermine practices creating problems in host countries and 
undermining the 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 public support for trade that those are all things that we have to be attentive to but at the same time i i do believe it is going to be strong purposeful american engagement that will turn out to be decisive yep well thank you very much you've thank been you, generous with your time and generous i think with the range of your answers uh, thank you to the audience for coming. We won't uh, be engaged in a, in a Q&A today. Okay. Thank you, Walter. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Yeah, it's okay about right. that part. And <laughs> I, know, uh, I know you've got some important engagements that yeah. you have to get to, so we'll try to let you get going quickly. But again, thank you, thank you all for coming, and thank, thank you very you. much. It's great to see you.